once did a solo climb on the Ganella Glacier of Mont Blanc, which uh, was real, real, real tough, including a nasty whiteout storm near the top of the mountain that left me marooned in a sleeping bag for 14 hours. I was aiming to set a, a speed record on the, the Ganella Glacier, although ended up getting real tired and then terrible weather came in. And so, yeah, it was 14 hours there in my bag doing sit-ups to, to keep the blood flow going. Welcome to the Go Hunt Life Show, hosted by Todd Nevins. This is Todd Nevins, and I interview people that had seemingly normal lives and careers going, but they pulled the ripcord and blew up their comfort bubbles to hunt down their life that they had always dreamed of living. On today's episode, I talk to Greg Nance, who has run 155 miles across the Gobi Desert in China and Mongolia, scaled some of the tallest mountains in the world, and is a startup founder of two global nonprofits, one of which he is growing from Shanghai, China. Oh, and he graduated from high school 10 years ago. His ripcord moment really happened just after high school when he started college, became a keynote speaker across nine different countries, and founded his first company, all by the time he was 19 years old. To add to all this, he's a 12 ambassador to the Seattle Seahawks after the team learned of his commitment to watching the games from China. Spoiler, it involves him running 30 miles round trip to a sports bar at 4 a.m. to watch the games. My conversation with Greg Nance starts right after a word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by PrintDirtCheap.com. Jeff Chrisman, the founder of Print Dirt Cheap, started his business the way most companies begin, with grit, determination, and a vision. And now, a decade later, he's built his company into an online printing powerhouse. If I've handed you a business card in the last four years, it was printed by Print Dirt Cheap. And the decals all over my laptop, they printed those too. They print and ship over 30 categories of printing products from business cards and decals to banners, company letterhead, restaurant menus, and a ton of direct mail pieces. And they have just rolled out an entirely new website, ensuring that your online user experience to place an order is simple and fast. And when you place that order, use promo code LIFEHUNTER for $10 off. And Jeff has just launched Success Hackers, which is a global group of tenacious entrepreneurs that share the latest tips, tools, and hacks into growing a business. Check it out at facebook.com forward slash success hackers. Greg, thank you for jumping on the show. My pleasure, Todd. Thanks for having me. It is 7 p.m. Austin time on a Wednesday. What time is it where you are and where are you? It is 9 a.m. Thursday here in Shanghai, China. If you were to walk outside, describe what you would see. Yeah, you would see a city of 25 million people, ton of dynamism and growth and rapid action. How old are you? Are you married? And do you have kids? I am 29 years old, unmarried with no children. All right. And your profession and primary ways that you earn a living, what's that? I have the opportunity to work as CEO of Dyad.com, which I'm excited to tell you more about. Very cool. A lot of the people that I talk to on this show, they have their their ripcord moment. Like they go to high school, they go to college, they graduate, they're like 5, 10, 20 years into their career, and they reach a point of like pulling the ripcord and completely doing something different. Researching you, it looks like you pulled the ripcord in high school 10 years ago in 2007 Uh when you like you graduated from high school and you immediately became a keynote speaker, which you still are today. How do you do that at high school? Yes, I'm really fortunate. I came from a a wonderful small town outside Seattle with parents that taught me that there is no such thing as failure, where whenever you face a setback, it's a huge learning opportunity. And I took that kind of mindset into high school debate, which was a formative experience alongside uh, baseball, basketball, football, tennis, track, and uh, learned a few things from those bumps and bruises growing up. And uh, yeah, following high school, had the chance to share some of those experiences um, in conferences and in uh, conventions of various kinds. And so there was that kind of minor ripcord moment. I love that phrase. And I (laughs) was able to uh, build a little bit of momentum. And then I've always felt like each of us are learning and each of us can share the things that we're learning to inform and inspire other folks on their journey as well. When was the first time that you got paid to speak? 
first time I got paid to speak was uh, 2009. Um, right. I had the chance to do a uh, uh, little bit of travel, actually, both to China and to, uh, to Switzerland, which was totally amazing, having the chance to uh, go overseas and share some experiences and some insight. After you got out of school, you went to the University of Chicago directly. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. And a year out of high school, you founded a company called MoneyThink that helps mm-hmm. students overcome the challenge of the biggest bar- barrier to attend college, which is, in fact, money. How were you paying for your schooling at the University of Chicago? Yeah. So uh, three primary buckets. So number one, I'm very, very fortunate. I had the chance to earn uh, scholarships to the University of Chicago. And so was able to take a, a very, very expensive uh, tuition and make it a lot more manageable. Uh, worked a variety of odd jobs during the summers, ranging from painting houses, working on roofs and decks, to splitting wood. Uh, topped out at about $14 an hour, which uh, isn't enough to cover uh, the remaining tuition. So my, my folks and uh, federal loans helped cover the difference. All right. So the, I mean, kind of everything, kind of the, the normal the normal the ways. Hot yeah. So taking that experience and you were at a really expensive school and then you founded Money Think, like how did how did your experience help you start that company? Yeah. So my uh, one of my big hobbies and it's developed into a passion is running. I think you learn a lot from uh, from running. It teaches. It's taught me a lot about life and about setting big goals. Um, I, I ran at the University of Chicago, and as part of our training, we'd run all around the South Side. And for those uh, listeners familiar, Chicago is a world class, amazing city, but with several um, areas where there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of poverty. And the University of Chicago is surrounded by a few of these neighborhoods. And training and running through them, you you see, look, a lot of folks don't have the opportunities that I took for granted growing up. And several friends and I had kind of a similar uh, realization in experiencing the neighborhood and the communities around us. And we wanted to do something about it. And we realized, look, as college students, we don't have a ton of life experience. We don't have teaching certifications, but we do have a lot of energy and we've got some enthusiasm and we've learned a little bit about applying to school and getting here. And I bet we could actually teach something. And Mm. little did we know, we'd learn even more by going out in the surrounding neighborhoods and working with high school students as they began planning for their own college education. So you founded it on, on a local premise. You dealt with the, you worked with the local community first. That's right. Within yeah, one mile of campus, there are a lot of high schools and uh, it was something like 110 cold calls before we got our first appointment to go meet with a, uh, a high school history teacher, a fellow named Mr. Matthew Hay from the South Shore School of Leadership. They he, and he was the first wow. call. Really? Why wouldn't they? Why did it take you 110 calls? Why weren't these schools? <laughs> why wouldn't they have welcomed you? I, I think uh, I was 19 at the time and had no clue what I was doing is the short answer. So <laughs> I think they sensed that. Yeah. So, okay. uh, Mr. Hay, in contrast, uh, I think he saw you know how green we were. But I think he also sensed, look, these guys – uh, they're really fired up to make a difference and my students need a little jolt and let's work together to make it happen. You, so where was the money that was a nonprofit and is a nonprofit. It's still, it's still running today. Where were right. you going to, where were you going to get the money to, to run the nonprofit and what were you going to help the students do? Yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. And that is we wanted students to, think about their future and the way that money can help them achieve those goals. And so building savings plans for college, building budgets and aligning their resources with their goals was, was really the, uh, the basic premise that we've, uh, we've stayed true to over the last nine plus years. And for, as far as funding goes, we were extraordinarily lean in the early days, spending less than a thousand dollars a year. And so that was primarily, yeah, primarily micro donations from friends and family and then a little bit of support from the University of Chicago Student Government and Dean's Fund. We've uh, we've grown that over the last nine years to about one point five million dollar annual budget, and now folks like Google and J.P. Morgan and uh, Pimco and uh, and Guggenheim and a few others are helping us bridge that gap today. Wow. All right. So, are you providing scholarships to these students, or are you still helping them? with their own finances to make the right decisions for their own goals. 
we are still helping students make those difficult decisions, set those big goals uh, as they go forward. Our primary product today is actually an SMS-based financial coaching service. So we're piloting a pretty awesome program in Illinois and California that will give real-time support and guidance as students go through the university application process and particularly the financial aid and scholarship process with trained college coordinators. What is... Speaking to Money Think specifically, what is the biggest impact that you've able been able to to see? I'm, I'm, what I'm getting at is like number of students that you help get into school compared to the graduation rate of those students, and comparing that to graduation rates of people of students that don't go through your program. Yeah, so we've helped now 14,000 students go through our program across 30 different communities in the U.S., which. Uh, we're really excited about, hey, like we've started making a difference and we're ambitious to get to that next level. And a key um, impact area for us is better measuring this impact. Um, and not only you know, the, the graduation rate is super important, as is college persistence. We want to build a program that in high school we can give you the toolkit not only to finish high school, go on to college, succeed there, finish there, and actually have a really smart financial plan. So you're able to do that with minimum debt accumulation, which gives you a lot of flexibility to then go on with your life. And um, at this stage, we're beginning to build out that longitudinal study and to then put it into action and to build a curriculum that actually delivers. Um, right now, I don't have um, comprehensive data to share with you, although we're certainly working on this. And I hope next time we chat, we've got more to show. Love it. Okay. And in 2012, you founded Dyad.com. When did you graduate from the University of Chicago? Yeah, so I finished Chicago in 2011 and then went straight to business school, to uh, University of Cambridge, which uh, amazing program. And one of the things I really liked about it was how action-oriented it was. I was challenged by one of my professors to come up with a business plan to solve a social challenge that inspired me. And uh, the social challenge was global education access and the ability to actually go to university, even if you're not from a super privileged country or community or family. And uh, that got me thinking and got me uh, cranking on what became dyad.com, which is a mentorship platform to help students apply for university and apply for scholarship funding. What is, what's the biggest difference? It seems like it's, it's definitely um, a stair step or, or certainly um, aligns well with money think. What is the biggest difference? Is it the mentorship? Yes, yeah, so actually, big, big commonalities here, and that's by design. So yeah. This is really a, a passion that I've stumbled upon in my, in my career. The, the key difference, I think, is our uh, target focus area and a little bit of the sort of pedagogical approach, like the actual learning style. So with MoneyThink, it's very much near peer. It's college students training um, high school students and then financial coaches working with those high school students and in order for them to build savings and budgeting plans going forward. Whereas at dyad.com, it's primarily students aiming for graduate study. So current college students applying for graduate study overseas, primarily in the U.S. And then admissions experts, a platform of experts working on a web platform, dyad.com, to help them step by step by step on our online workspace. So both have mentorship. Both are very goal-oriented. Uh, both are both uh, learning and results-oriented uh, with slightly different focus areas. Where does the, your revenue come from? We are a B to C platform. So actually families, uh, when they're thinking through their children's future, learn about diet.com and say, wow, this is a great way for us to help our child get the very best education and get funding to pay for it. All right. So you're helping with the scholarships as well. Why did you start the company in Shanghai versus the United States? Yeah. So I, uh, number one was adventure. I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, 23-year-old business school grad and wanted a big adventure. And China was a place of long-term curiosity. So I wanted to go check it out. Uh, as I Once I'd figured, hey, China would be a cool place to actually get this thing going, learned more about great consumer market. It's a huge consumer market. Uh, it's There's a big talent advantage, too. You have a lot of really great young graduates with good skills that uh, – um, and with kind of an economic advantage too, the cost of doing business here is somewhere around 25% what you'd pay in like the Valley. Um, and 
including my hometown of Seattle or even like Austin and Boston. So uh, big price advantage, big consumer market, strong talent, uh, and a good adventure too. Are you only helping students in China or are you helping students globally? Actually globally. So yeah, we've helped students now uh, paying clients from 26 different countries and with users in like 180 plus. Wow. And so what is the primary difference at the university level, the college level in China compared to the United States? Yeah. So one thing that really surprised us in China, you take what's called the Gao Tao exam and it's like a national examination. Imagine the SAT, but depending on your score, your exact path is like locked in. So like if you get a 1550 equivalent, this is the school you go to. This is the major that you can study. Whereas if you're at a 1300, here are the options that you'll have. And so you're kind of locked in to a university and to a major when you're 18 years old with very little flexibility. And so I've had some version of the conversation. I love learning languages, but I'm, I'm stuck stu- studying accounting or mm. I love finance, but I'm stuck studying English. Uh, that's really, really common in China in the Chinese system. And the Chinese system is optimized to churn out you know, millions of graduates every year, but not optimized for you to pursue your, your individual preferences and your real passion. And so part of what we do at Diet is actually help unlock your personal development, your real preferences, and then help you actually build out step by step by step some skills and competencies within that passion that you're forming. In a couple of minutes, I've got a few more questions regarding to education, and then we're going to jump into your like personal accomplishments from ultra running and swimming and climbing and, and, uh, and, and scaling mountains. But first, a couple more questions on the education side. According to Bloomberg, the price of a, of a college degree in the last 30 years has increased 1,120%. Are we at a point where a college education is no longer a fi- the right financial decision for someone. Hey, I think we've cert- – and that's a crazy fact from Bloomberg. Wow, I, I hadn't heard that and that's, that's food for thought. Um, certainly we are at a point where families and students need to think really carefully about how their goals align with financial realities. Uh, I think totally uh, we passed the day where sign up for just the best school you get into and hope for the best because – that leads to crippling debt and a lot of financial mistakes that we make. And it's an unfortunate reality because I wish it were more affordable. Um, and I think families around the U.S. and around the world are having this conversation. I remember mine in December of 2006 talking to my, my mom and dad about what was possible for us. Uh, you know, I'm looking at an offer from West Point U.S. Military Academy, which is it's free. They, they pay you to go there versus uh, the University of Chicago, which would be far more expensive. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, my aim really is to give the uh, the information and some insight to help families make the right decision. Um, and so that I think is is certainly true of uh, uh, of every family. And I think for many many students pursuing community college, pursuing uh, pursuing vocational education, or the most affordable four year opportunity is the right move, as opposed to going for just the, the highest ranked, even if it's the most expensive. So I'm glad this is a national conversation. Uh, Because, frankly, it should have been for a a while, and we're going to need support at local, at at federal levels, and with universities to help bridge this gap because the cost has become astronomic, and it's it's unfair to uh, the middle and working classes in the U.S. Uh, We need to educate the very best that we can, and yet we're falling short of that now. It is. And it's interesting that you, what you brought up about China, if depending upon what you, your score is and what you score, what particular areas and categories that you score high in that determines the, your career path. But on the flip side of that, at an 18 year old sitting at the kitchen table with their parents, they have an, an unlimited number of choices. How in the world are they expected to make the choice for the rest of their life at 18 a day out of high school over the kitchen table. It's, it seems incredibly unrealistic yet. A lot of people do that. They go to even a state school. Let's say they go to the university of, of Texas and they live in the state of Texas. Well, they're still plunking down 30 grand a year. They're still looking at $120,000 for the next four years, hoping that that person made the right decision at 18 at that kitchen table. That's pretty daunting. 
it is it is daunting and you know frankly i did not have anywhere near the maturity at age 18 to make those that level of consequential decision i mean who does absolutely i mean yeah seriously so i'm 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 really fortunate to have great teachers and mentors and and parents that were patient and understanding and really invested a lot to uh help me grow and develop and mature. And I think everyone grows and matures at different levels. Uh, my kind of vision for what education can do is give you little career test drives as you go and make sure that the, the cost of uh, failures or setbacks is as minimal as we can make it. And I think that flexibility in the education system is uh, critically important and one thing that we're still falling short of uh, at a national level. You're in, in Shanghai, and you looked at it as an adventure when you were young. I mean, you were in your 20s, and, and you have chosen that, that place to, uh, to go to. Um, I actually work with a company that's a nonprofit that provides a service that's a gap year. It's uncommon awesome. in the United States for somebody to – it's getting more common, luckily. But, but um, 10 and 20 years ago, it was extremely uncommon for some United States person, a student, to take a gap year – uh, and travel the globe and backpack across Europe and Asia. It, do you recommend that? I think it's a great idea. Uh, I think it's going to expose you to so many new opportunities that you couldn't have even envisioned when starting out on a gap year. Uh, too often we feel locked in to what like the herd is doing. What are our classmates doing? What's everybody up to? And we end up, are, we're made to feel uh, dumb or inferior if we're not doing the traditional track. But in my view, actually, that's a big mistake because we grow and develop at different uh, levels. Our goals are at different levels of clarity at different levels. And so in, in my view, a gap year is a great way to go figure out what makes you happy, what makes you smile. And I think life's short. So doing more of what makes you smile, what really fires you up is uh, – is the right move. And if a gap year is calling to you, I think it's great. And if you don't yet know very much about it, I think, uh, organizations, Todd, like the one you're working with are a great source of information to, uh, to dive in and to go explore. If you could snap your fingers right now, you've been, you strike, when I was researching you, you strike me as someone that would have not completed a college degree and just completely gone off on your own and started multiple businesses without finishing college. Was that ever a consideration? Yeah. You know, so in some respects, you know, I, I caught the entrepreneurial bug uh, early and by accident. So it was about a year into working on Money Think before a friend said, oh, wow, that's cool that you're an entrepreneur. And I remember thinking, wow, like, am I? I'm kind of figuring out what does that even mean? So it was never, I never set out to be an entrepreneur. It just, it sort of happened that, that uh, working on projects and businesses uh, really excited me. And I, I love working with great teams and great people. Uh, so it, it was certainly you know, by accident. It, it developed and formed uh, organically as it went. Uh, for me, you know, education is a big value in our household. So my parents sacrificed a ton to put three, three kids through college. My uh, grandparents, all you know, from rural Mississippi, sacrificed a ton to give my parents a chance for a college degree. So uh, that was always a value in our household. So I, I never seriously considered uh, dropping out, uh, particularly because the university was such a big supporter. Um, U Chicago, where I went to school, uh, was kind of going through a uh, an entrepreneurial renaissance of sorts where they really wanted to, to help students with those aspirations uh, achieve them. And I felt just so well supported that you know, the place to build that business was definitely from the dorm room at Chicago. And so uh, I never felt that urge, although I know some people do, and uh, more power to them. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Click Placement, a digital agency designing Google AdWords and pay-per-click marketing strategies for startups, small businesses, and even people building a side hustle. Hit up clickplacement.com to start a conversation. If you would like to personally support the Go Hunt Life podcast, Go to patreon.com forward slash go hunt life to make a donation. All right. From there, we're going to jump into some of your crazy personal uh, accomplishments uh, that somehow you've been able to fit in through college and, and advanced degrees and starting companies and traveling the world. But you are also, this is crazy, an ultra runner, swimmer, climber, mountaineer to the point where you have ran an ultra marathon 
across the Gobi Desert, which is 250 kilometers, which in United States speak is 155 <laughs> miles. Uh-huh. Uh which did which you said you were a runner in high school like was running your first passion and then it just rolled into all of the rest the the, the first passion for me actually was spending time with my family outdoors my uh, my dad is one of my all-time heroes and he loved hiking and so my big sister little brother and I would follow dad out in the Olympics and the Cascade Mountains which uh, being from the Evergreen State, we are so, so lucky. It's, it's God's paintbrush. You've got these incredible forests and mountains, the ocean right there. And I love spending time with my family outdoors. So we would go to these really fun adventures. And, you know, over time, my dad started uh, saying, hey, let's try out this one. Let's try out that one. And you know, as a young guy, I started doing more and more of this. We ended up uh, climbing my first volcano, Mount St. Helens, when I was 12 years old. And I was just totally hooked. Yeah, this is my favorite way to spend time with my family, and I love being outdoors. And so I started running shortly thereafter, was doing the open water swimming thing in the Puget Sound growing up. And what I realized is, look, I actually – I love all these activities, and they actually make me, I think, a better student and now a better uh, professional where setting a big goal as a runner – it requires a lot of the same energy and initiative that setting a big goal for your career might have or for a key relationship in your life might have. And uh, that's how I've really dove in there and kind of uh, grown and risen to the occasion in each. Was your Gobi Desert run the longest run that you, of your life? That it, That's the longest uh, sort of total distance I've done. And that was actually a stage race, like think Tour de France style, where we basically run a marathon a day. For, uh, for six days there in the Gobi. The, uh, the longest continuous was a, a 200K um, straight through, which is about 125 miles. And that was in the uh, kind of Malaysian highlands uh, through uh, the jungle there north of uh, Kuala Lumpur, which that was a rough one. It was super hot and the sun reflects big time on those hills. Was that your hardest thing that you've physically accomplished? That, uh, I would rank that uh, top alongside... Um, once did a solo climb on the Ganella Glacier of Mont Blanc, which uh, was real, real, real tough, including a nasty whiteout storm near the top of the mountain that left me marooned in a sleeping bag for 14 hours. By yourself, how many days or hours did you leave the crew behind and go up by yourself? I, so I, this was at the end of business school to celebrate. And I initially had a crew of four guys that were going to go, but uh, life got in the way. And so I was the only one that was able to make it to the mountain and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was aiming to set a, a speed record on the, the Ganella Glacier, although ended up getting real tired, and then terrible weather came in. And so, yeah, it was 14 hours there in my bag doing sit-ups to to keep the blood flow going. At any point through your adventures, did you ever think you're not going to make it out? Like, have you had a near-death experience in all of this? The uh, that day on Mont Blanc was a rough one. I uh, uh, I, I was certainly concerned for my uh, fingers and toes and you know couldn't feel them for the last 12 hours of that and uh, you know three folks ended up uh, passing away that day up high on Mont Blanc including a fellow who was the uh, the reigning ski mountaineering world champion so some, some really really experienced climbers got got hit even harder than I did I was really lucky to get into a refuge there in the, the rocks but uh, but others weren't um, that, that was, I think, the, the closest. Another silly uh, silly one, uh, swimming across the Douro River, which is in, uh, in Portugal. I uh, was crossing there at, at Porto, and the current was very, very swift. The tide's coming in, uh, and there's some boats passing as well. And basically, it was uh, in a little bit over my head. Ended up getting dragged a little bit by the undertow and had to really fight that. So I remember getting to the shore and just kind of collapsing in prayer, being grateful for kind of a second chance after putting myself in a, in a foolish spot there. So what is your, what is your next big, some people would say foolish accomplishment that you're <laughs> aiming at? <laughs> What's next on the horizon that, uh, that maybe you're a little worried about? Hey, the, the, so I've got a bunch of kind of ultras on the horizon, although the one that's firing me up most, it's uh, 14 months away. So I've got a little bit of training time to get ready. It's called the world marathon challenge. And it's, uh, you run a marathon a day for seven days on seven continents. My gosh. How 
the I'm thinking more logistically traveling planes. How many people uh, do this? How many people would be doing that? I so 54 people have accomplished that feat so far, uh, which. Uh, yeah, and I'm excited to throw my hat in the ring to try to make it happen as well. It logistically, I think, is the toughest challenge because you've got to figure a way to get from Antarctica on to Cape Town, over to Perth, up to Dubai, over to Madrid, down to Colombia, then up to Miami, all within 168 hours, all while running those uh, those marathons in between. And Miami, are you going to be in a like the Miami Marathon, or are you guys running just and girls running just? The 54 of you or the 200 people that attempted, I mean, how, are you guys, are you all running together? You, yeah, you run together uh, and it's organized by this group, the World Marathon Challenge Group. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so luckily they handle a lot of the logistics and I believe each race is actually planned to be uh, a standalone. So it's, it's really like a group Got of 15 it. people that will actually go out and attempt it and uh, hopefully power through to the finish line and then be able to hop on. Uh, for, hop on the jet for the next uh, the next flight out. Oh, that's true. Only 15 or so people are going to do it because only 54 people have accomplished it. Oh my gosh. Have you broken any world records? Not yet. Although I, uh, <laughs> try, trying to keep, uh, uh, working hard so that I have got a shot to, uh, you know, do my very best there. Do you have one in mind? The, uh, th- there are two kind of meta challenges that I, I'm excited to, to try to, to do. Uh, one is, the New York to Seattle cross country run. I would love to, would love to be in the kind of shape where I can, can accomplish that and do it in one of the, the fastest uh, times. I, the second is uh, it's called the, uh, this, you know, climbing the seven summits. And a lot of folks now have climbed the highest mountain on each continent. One of my goals is to actually uh, do the seven summit sprint where kind of start on Everest and then do all seven within the, the, smallest time window possible, um, all the while raising awareness and funds for issues in education access. Yeah. How do you weave in your physical accomplishments like this with your, with raising money and, and your, 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 your mission there? Yeah. So I view the two as it's a big synergy because in order to find the time to train and to stay kind of healthy and fit and focused, it helps to have just continued inspiration. And so I, I love to link it with a fundraising and awareness target around great organizations doing great work. And so, you know, my, uh, that climb on Mont Blanc I told you about, uh, was, was actually part of my first charity challenge back in 2012. And with, uh, in seven days, I was, I called the seven day challenge where we climbed Mont Blanc, swam across the Thames river there in London, and then ran, Hadrian's Wall, which is at the UK coast to coast, and uh, doing all that within seven days, it makes it you know, even uh, an even bigger challenge. But I knew that hey, I'm doing this to raise some cash for Money Think, which is doing awesome work in financial capability. That's why I'm training for this. That's why I'm, you know, I'm swimming in the Cam River and it's cold and frigid. But like, <laughs> we're doing this because there's a great cause and it's a big challenge. Uh, and so yeah, I view them as really. Uh, it's a great synergy. You're going to be stronger in training with that inspiration. It sounds like it. What are what the next six months? What do they look like for you? And what's the biggest uh, what's the biggest thing that you're looking at in the next six months? Yeah, so I, I've got a fun swimming challenge coming up later this month. I'm gonna, uh, gonna be in Greece for uh, for the new year and planning to swim the uh, the Aegean. So do a nice uh, polar bear dip there to start 2018. Got a uh, an ultra in the Tibetan foothills coming up called the Gao Li Gong which is a hundred miler and it's going to be just stunning. The photos look awesome. So I'm, I'm really pumped on that. And then, uh, I, I work with Brooks. It's a, it's an amazing shoe company based out of Seattle sure. and, uh, helping them do some, uh, China based, um, uh, kind of a community building. We're trying to get more Chinese running, living healthy lifestyles. And Brooks is really committed to building the, the run happy mentality, which I'm proud to support. So doing some cool work there too. What is run happy mentality? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think uh, so, there's so many issues that each of us confront day to day. There's a ton of stress. We're always it's go 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 for a lot of us. And I find that when I put on you know, my, my my Brooks and I'm just doing a nice run to either end or to start my day, it puts things in perspective and it, it brings a smile to my face. I think to hundreds of thousands, millions of others around the world. And Brooks, uh, one of the value that I really appreciate 
is that a run can solve almost any challenge. We can look at it in a new light. We can think through it. We can refresh our, uh, our perspective or our attitude. And all of a sudden, we've got you know, newfound hope and optimism and energy to, uh, to solve whatever that might be. And so that's what the run happy mentality means to me. Excellent. And I, uh, I've got to bring this up because you are a ridiculous Seattle Seahawks fan. You are yes. over the top passionate. <laughs> and recently, or, or within the last year or so, you were named a 12 ambassador. What is that? Yeah. So th- this is a fun one. So I'm a huge Seahawks fan literally since before I was born. My, my dad is uh, one of his first jobs was uh, being a beer vendor at the, the kingdom for the Seattle Seahawks. So awesome. it's been in the blood since, yeah, since before I was born. I, uh, I wore my Seahawks jersey to peewee football practice every day growing up and always dreamed of playing a wide receiver for the team. Uh, if you if you see if you take a look at my build, that was never going to happen. I, I top out <laughs> at about 160 pounds, so didn't it didn't have a realistic shot at that. But uh, there are a lot of us though uh, around the world that, that love our team, the Seattle Seahawks, and um, uh, there was a global fan competition put on by the team to find a, a Super 12. The 12 refers to our fans who are loud and crazy uh, to go along with the 11 players on the field, and uh, I was asked to submit a little video, which I did. Uh, and chat, chat, chat a little bit about why I admire our team. And I, I love uh, our always compete mentality. I'm a huge fan of how we've uh, built our team full of underdogs and competitors and uh, how we're really community oriented. Every, you know, so many of the players are in the community doing awesome work, whether it's at Seattle's Children with Russell Wilson, whether it's blanket coverage giving uh, kind of poor kids the coats like Richard Sherman or if it's building houses in Haiti, like Cliff Avril, uh, or a better Seattle with Pete Carroll, our coach. Uh, there's just some really, really great community work happening too. So I, I just, I love this team. And uh, I was asked by the Seahawks and Delta Airlines, our, our sponsor, to uh, do a little video project. And so I, I run to the sports bar every Monday morning at 4 a.m. to watch and to cheer on the team. And uh, that includes a 30-mile round trip job. Whoa. And so a little film crew accompanied me in my Seahawks jersey, Seahawks hat during the run and onto the sports bar where we watched together. So it was a, just a surreal and fun, uh, full of surprise kind of a project that uh, it's been a real blessing. Incredible. All right. Last question. On April 8th, 2010, you sent out your first tweet at Greg Nance. Do you remember what it was? Ooh, I have no idea. What was it? <laughs> I- I'm running for student government president of U Chicago. The campaign kicks off in two hours. Hey, awesome. That, uh, that was real fun. Thanks for digging that up. Uh, no, no worries. If you could go back in time and like sit next to yourself, knowing what you know now, seven years later, seven and a half years later, what advice would you give yourself? Hey, uh, that's a great question. The, the chief advice I'd give myself is to sleep more. Um, I've now found in the year since that, the, uh, nothing makes me feel stronger and healthier and happier than eight hours of sleep. Um, back in that day, I was really burning the candle both ends. You know, we're talking three or four hours of, uh, of sleep each night, which in retrospect was, was not optimal. And so that would be the key advice I'd give to myself and to any listeners trying to level up. Sleep more. I love it. All right. You can find Greg at gregnance.org, also at dyad, D-Y-A-D dot com and moneythink.org. And of course, on Twitter at Greg Nance. Greg, thank you very much for joining me. Todd, had a blast. Thank you for the invitation. Don't forget to hit up the online printing rock stars at printdirtcheap.com and use promo code LIFEHUNTER for $10 off. Hey, Life Hunters, thank you for listening to this episode of Go Hunt Life. If you like the show and would like to support it, go to iTunes and do this. Subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and review it. It helps. And thank you. If you or someone that you know has quit their normal life to follow their dreams, I would love an introduction and maybe interview them on the show. You can find me at GoHuntLife.com and also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at GoHuntLife. Until next time, stay weird, dare greatly, and ripcord out.